Turn in your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 9. We're going to be beginning really in verse 20 this morning, but I, I really want to look at and camp out at and look at conversion. I don't know that we really talk about conversion enough in the church today. Um, and we're currently looking at one of the greatest conversions of the Bible, although they're all amazing. We're looking at Saul of Tarsus, and as he goes to, D to Damascus from Jerusalem, some 160 miles. I had forgot to turn on my microphone. Some 160 miles he is traveling um, to arrest. He's getting letters from the chief priest uh, from the synagogues, the Sanhedrin in uh, Jerusalem. And he wants to stomp out. He wants to destroy. He wants to slaughter this way that has entered into the Jewish uh, faith that, that is teaching that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. That the, the promised Messiah of God. And that he has risen from the dead. And so he wants to stomp this out. And if you remember, this great persecution began with the stoning of Stephen, who was, was arguing with the Hellenists, the Grecian-speaking, uh, uh, the Greek-speaking uh, Jews. And uh, they, couldn't, they couldn't deal with his wisdom that God gave him and his answers of the truth. And listen, you might think, uh, uh, well, oh, I could never speak the way Paul did, or I could never talk the way that they do, or I could... Listen, when you speak truth, that's all you need to know. That's the wisest thing in the world. How could you get more wise than truth? When you just share the simple truth of the scriptures, it doesn't mean it has to be profound or something that's complicated, but it's the, it's the most wisdom you're ever going to gain, is to just simply... In, instill truth into people's lives listen and give a soft answer of truth and that's what we see Stephen was doing that's what we see that God wants us to do with every person that we meet and so Saul is going to uh, arrest and deliver them back to Jerusalem to imprison them to have them put to death and uh, he meets Jesus on the road to Damascus all of us have had a Damascus Road conversion if we've come to salvation and we're truly there. Listen, I say that purposely because Saul himself, Paul, over in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, says this. Examine yourself as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourself. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified, but I trust that you will know that we are not disqualified. They were, they were questioning his apostleship. They were questioning he's the one that led them to the Lord, planted the church in Corinth. And, and he says to them, wait a minute, test yourself. Put yourself on trial. Examine yourself. Is there evidence? That Jesus Christ is in you. Is there a true conversion? A true conversion in your life? Notice with Saul, he hears Jesus' voice. He says, who out to our Lord? And we, and we see a physical thing happen. He goes blind from the seeing the glory of the Lord. His physical eyes are now closed. And he has to be led into Damascus. Now, I believe all conversions happen the same way, yet differently. Now, I know you don't understand that, but with God, that can happen. We're all saved when our conscience meets the truth, Jesus Christ, truth is a person, and then the Holy Spirit baptizes us into the body of Christ. But we have to believe that truth, repent of who we are, change our mind of where we're going and what we're doing, and begin to follow Jesus. You don't turn just from your sin, but you turn to a holy God, to his provision for the sin nature. So important that you don't just stop going where you used to go, but you start going to the throne room. That's conversion. It's so important that you don't just stop doing this, but you begin to do that. 
Paul will later say that you don't just stop stealing, but you get a job and you start working and you give back to the body of Christ. That's a complete turnaround. That's conversion. You don't just stop the drinking, but you become so heart concerned because of the Spirit of God that you want to see the people you used to drink with stop drinking and come to salvation. It's, it's, it's radical. It's, it's amazing. It's not just I stopped doing this and I started going to church. Conversion. Listen, conversion in the Webster's 1828 generally means a turning or a change from one state to another. In theological or moral sense, it means a change of heart or dispositions of the heart. Listen to me. It means our hard, unrepentant, stubborn heart is subdued by the love of God, the truth of God, the blood of the cross of Calvary, and we surrender completely to this love and come underneath his authority to supply and change us into his image for his glory. That's a lot. It's not complicated, but we can't stay stubborn and unrepentant and continue to reject his authority and his truth and say that we truly repented and we're being converted or conformed into the image of Christ. We turn. We turn. The word as used in Acts 3.19 where you know we already covered that. When they said, well, what shall we do, brethren, when, they, when their conscience was met with the truth of Jesus Christ rising from the dead, that he was the Messiah, which, listen to me, that's the very thing that Saul is trying to stomp out. That's the very thing the devil is trying to stomp out, is the truth that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He's the Messiah of God, the anointed of God that has come to take away the sins of the world. The Saul was being used by the devil to stomp it out then. Others have been used by the devil to stomp it out for years, and they're still trying to erase that truth. And he says, what shall we do? And in 3.19 it says, repent, metanoia, turn, change your mind and turn, Therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out, wiped away, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. You get new breath, new fresh air from heaven, from the presence of the Lord. And that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all of his prophets since the world began. Listen, this is not new news. This is the good news that's always been given. It's been given since Genesis. It's being made more clear. The mystery is being uncovered. It's being revealed to you and I in these last days. But the devil is still trying to cover it up. The devil is trying to sweep it under the carpet. He's trying to hide it. And you and I are supposed to be examining ourselves. We're supposed to be looking for the evidence of true conversion. So that we're not deceived. Because if you die physically today and you've been deceived into following religiosity. You've been deceived into following another Jesus. You've been tricked and never came fully to the state of conversion because of a heart that surrenders. Then you'll be cast into hell. Now think about conversion. This is what it means here in the Greek. Convert, converted. It means to revert. It, it, it means it means to return, to turn about, to turn, come back to your creator. It means to turn towards, to turn from your rebellion, turn from the lies, turn from your sin, turn from the, your current father who is the devil, and turn to truth. Turn to a new way. Turn to the God of the universe who created us. It means to turn quite around or reverse. 
And, and really, salvation really has some parts that go with it. Repentance by faith leads to conversion. Listen, repent means to change your mind. And when you change your mind, if you truly repent, you turn around and go the other way towards God. We were going towards hell. We were living in our own authority. We were under the devil. And we believed, trusted our spiritual salvation into the gospel message of Jesus Christ atoning for our sins with his blood on the cross. We believed that. And that begins conversion. The Spirit of God baptizes us into the body of Christ. Now listen to me, though, because I believe there's many false converts because the devil tricks us. He plays games with us. We feel good about it. Listen to it. If I tell you, hey, come on over to my house. I, I, I converted my basement into a rec room. Remember my old basement all done dingy and cobwebs and it's wet down there? You remember when you was down there helping me and I tell you this story? And, and you come over. Only thing I did was throw the ping pong table, ping pong table down there. Like, it's a nice rec room, isn't it? This is, look, look at this rec room I converted. You're like, what? <clears throat> oh, yeah, I spent a long time. I've been working on a basement for a long time. You still see the cobwebs? You still see the wet walls, the mold growing in the corners. And the only thing there is is a little ping pong table down there. And I'm telling you, I've converted it into a rec room. You're going to think I'm quite crazy. You're not going to want to come back again. You'll be like, he says he converted that into a rec room. And he ain't did nothing down there. He ain't even sweep the floor. But think about this. Seriously. Seriously. Conversion. I didn't turn it into something else. I didn't repaint it. I didn't resupply it. I didn't clean it. You're standing in my basement. It's wet. It's musky. You're like, I'm getting sick in my belly. Just stand down here. I can't breathe and play ping pong. You didn't convert that basement. You just added something to it. And much of Christianity is this type of false conversion. I don't, I, I don't want to speak against God's church. It's not the work that you and I have done. It's the work that he has done. But true conversion, it sweeps it clean. It, it empties the house out. And God begins by the Holy Spirit to bring in a new supply. New redecorating. Hanging new pictures on the wall. He's doing everything in our heart. And it's all of love. And he begins to put himself in us. And then all of a sudden you have the joy over here and the peace over here and the patience over here. You have goodness. All the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control begin to redecorate your house. You know, you're on your road to Damascus with letters from chief priests to arrest and destroy that way. And then all of a sudden, God changes your heart so much that you write letters to tell other people about life. Your life changes so much, you're going in this direction with letters from some authority that comes from the devil to chief priest in a false religious system that has forgotten God. And you turn around and he begins to prepare you to be a letter for all men to be read. With Paul, he writes letters now. He's going with death. He's hanging out with death. He's bringing death. He wants to kill Jesus. And then what does God do in his conversion? He writes three quarters of the New Testament all about how to have life and godliness. All about how to live for Jesus. And this is conversion. It's not that you just throw in Sunday service and you go and listen and feel good about it. It's, it's total conversion. You, you begin to have this personal love relationship with the God of the universe. When you meet him, you want to be like him. Because you realize that you were like your father before the devil. And that there's love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. And a hope and a future that can be had by surrendering our hard hearts to a loving God who's already did the whole thing. It's finished. Christ, 
cried as he was on the cross. And all you have to do is believe in it. Trust in it. He's faithful and just to forgive you of your sin if you'll come and repent. And conversion, keep cleansing you from all unrighteousness. Keep cleansing, keeps washing. See, our new position is righteousness in Christ because of what he's done. But the conversion has to take place because our hearts have to be converted to his way of thinking, his way of life. It's not true belief if it just starts at the starting line and then it goes back and does everything it wants to do. That's not changing your mind. That's not changing your direction. That's not turning from and turning to a living God. That is not conversion. That's simply one prayer. Now our life has to be saturated in prayer. In fact, I'm convinced if you're not spending time at the throne room praying, you'll never be converted. I'm not telling you that... that you're working your way into salvation. I'm telling you, if you are saved, you will want to pray. What is the single most thing that you, that's striking in this text where we see this man wanting to kill Christians? What does God say about him to Ananias? Behold, he prays. Jesus said, my house should be a house of prayer. See, it's a place of dependency. It's a place of saying, you know what? I've been living in, as an enemy of God, in rebellion, listening to the lie, following the devil, doing what self-life wants to do, and Christ paid for that with his blood. And if I receive that, now I want to place myself under the dependency, the authority, the, the house of God. I want to be his child, so now I have to be dependent upon him. I have to look to what he's saying as my authority and for my conversion, because if not, I'll be deceived and keep following self and the lies and the father of all lies, because the world lies are to sway of the wicked one. So in prayer, I come and I say, Lord, here I am. Here I am, Lord. I'm a sinner. I have a heart that wants to do what I want to do. Can you change me, Lord? Will you convert me, Lord? I see what you've done with others. I see what you did with Saul of Tarsus. So I know that your arm is not short. That you can save. If you can change Saul, you can change me. So here I am, Lord. I want to be dependent upon you. I want you to resupply my heart. Tear down the walls. Listen, this is easy stuff. I was talking about it with my 10-year-old grandbaby this morning. It's easy stuff. Yet it's the hardest thing on the planet to do. But God's power, strength, might, furnishing, supply, His blood, everything is there. All the materials, everything you need to do it is sitting there freely. And all you have to do is ask, seek, and knock. Keep asking, seeking, and knocking. And stop being self-dependent and independent and begin to be Christ-dependent, knowing that all of our life and godliness is hidden in Him. That's real conversion, where you can actually examine yourself you can actually, I mean, listen, you don't see your fruit as much as others might, but you can examine yourself and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. I began a prayer life. I began reading the Bible. I began a love relationship with the God of the universe. And, and I may not be what he's going to make me, but I'm not who I used to be. Now, I'm not trying to give you an excuse to keep sinning. I'm not trying to give you an excuse to fall short. What I'm saying is, are you truly believing and being converted or are you being deceived by a religious system that would actually go out and send letters to kill Christians they weren't called Christians yet but they will be soon in Antioch where is your conversion at today are you being converted 
by the power of the Holy Spirit. Here's a number one way. Look at this, what happened in Acts chapter 9, verse 19. Remember Saul had been blind, immediately scales fall in 18 from his eyes. And then he gets up and Ananias or somebody baptizes him in water. Look at 19. When he had received food, so he, he ate because he'd been fasting, seeking the Lord. He said, I've got to have answers. I'm at the throne room. He's praying. Behold, he prays. And he prays seriously. He prays, he prays wanting to know the truth so much that he gave up food. He's fasting. He was strengthened, and then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. What did he do? First thing, he was fellowshipping. He changed who he was hanging out with. He came to go to the synagogue, but he wasn't there. Notice that. He was with other disciples. He was fellowshipping. The word prayer and fellowship are the things that, that, that grows the church. We went through this in Acts 2.42. Yet the church in America doesn't want to be in prayer. They don't want to get in the word. And they don't want to fellowship with other disciples. That's the deception that's going on that keeps true conversion from ever happening. True conversion is changing the heart. Not just a head knowledge of the blood of Jesus. Not just a head knowledge of the cross of Christ. Not just a head knowledge of truth. Because that can puff up. Conversion is of the heart. Where you enter into the work of the ministry. You begin to seek out. What do you want me to do Lord? So you've got past the who are you Lord. You know he's the savior. But now you begin to move into. What do you want me to do Lord? And you begin to be obedient. Not deceiving yourself. You become a doer. Not a hearer only. And he fellowship with the disciples at Damascus. Why? Because they were already growing and ahead of him. And he could learn how to be a disciple. He could learn all those things that he has missed. While he was struggling and fighting with God. And ignoring the goads that were getting him along and trying to turn him to Jesus. And now he can go and say, oh, here's a new whole body of people that will help me take off the grave clothes and walk into new life. The Bible tells us Paul later, Saul here. What's the reference on that? Hebrews 9.24, is that correct? 10.24 and 25. Um, and let us consider one another. Got the verse. How did I forget that verse? And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good deeds, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as we see the day approaching. It's Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. Are you assembling together with other disciples? Because you cannot be converted while still chasing the things of the world. You cannot be converted and changed into the image of the living God while our hearts are still being trained to chase everything else, to be underneath the authority of self, to be underneath the authority of the devil, and still follow the flesh. We have to surrender. We have to take our stubborn hearts and say, you know what? This is the authority of God. This is the word of God. This is the prescription from the great physician that I should read the word of God, learn to hear his voice, that I should be in prayer with him, learning to be dependent upon him. And then I also need to give myself away and be a servant that would help the rest of the body of Christ. So I need to be in fellowship with them. And I need to grow with them and rub elbows with them. You know, I told somebody the other day, I said, you have to have, you have, to have fellowship because that's where the iron sharpens the iron. One of the best things that I'm at, I'm really good at iron sharpening iron. Sparks fly when I'm in the room. I'm really good at that. You guys can say Amen. But it's, but it's also living stones being chipped away at and we're being fitted together as a holy house. Christ is the chief cornerstone. He's the head and the end. 
But we cannot keep going and doing everything that we always do and say, I believe in Jesus. I've repented. I'm being converted. No, we're still going the same way. We're still chasing the same things. There's still what moves our heart. So we're being deceived by all that's out here. As opposed to saying, no, I know what it takes for life and godliness. Christ, listen, Christ died for my sins. And I am saved by the blood of Jesus. And my position now is a child of God. But God took away the power and the penalty. And he wants to take away the practice and train our hearts to, to want to follow him because of his great love. Let me pray before I get way ahead of myself. And then we'll get into this text. Father, we have been born into a system. Of religious teaching and we know Lord that the gates of hell will not prevail against your church but Lord we also know that the devil is deceiving the elect if it's possible we ask Lord that we would not be deceived that we would not live culturanity but we would live Christianity where we are becoming Christ like as we're converted as we are conformed by the Holy Spirit into the image of the living God as your servants, suffering servants. That that would be our testimony. That we would not think we're okay as we examine our lives because it lines up with what we call the visible Christianity. But we would examine our lives with your son Jesus and what the testimony of other saints that went before us, that is written down in your word as the plumb line. Give us a desire, Lord, to be in your word, to be in prayer in your throne room, seeking your face, to be in fellowship so we can help others grow and we can be helped to grow. Pour out your spirit and help us to understand your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, he was in, the first thing that he did was in fellowship with other disciples. Are you in fellowship? He's speaking to the Lord, he's praying, and he's in fellowship. And he hasn't been born again very long, has he? But it's something the Spirit instantly does in his life. It's something that Christ instantly wants for his life and sends other disciples to tell him, to lay hands on him. Ananias, Yahweh is gracious, it means, comes and lays his hands on him. He probably baptized him. He was one of the people that Saul was coming to kill. He had letters. And then let's read. It's Acts 9 and 20. Immediately, he preached the Christ. Immediately he preached to Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Then all who heard were amazed and said, Is this not he who destroyed those who called on the name in Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose so that he might bring them bound to the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. Now, after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul, and they, and, and they watched the gates night and day to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and led him down through the wall in a large basket. And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles, and he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road, and that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So he was with them at Jerusalem, coming in and going out, and he spoke boldly by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and disputed against the Hellenists, but they attempted to kill him. When the brethren found out, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him out to Tarsus. Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. Let 
Again, conversion. True conversion. Stops what it was doing. Turns the other way. Goes in another direction. Not just... Not just, I said a prayer at the altar. Listen to me. I don't believe it's evil to have an altar call. But I believe it's helping false conversion in the American church. I believe to tell somebody that all they have to do to, to be saved is to say a prayer makes them think that they're okay. So you have, if you're going to have altar calls, the biggest thing you have to have after that is altar counselors that will take them away and talk to them and let them know they didn't do anything except make a stand that they were going to believe and that they believed the message that they heard. But that in order for conversion and true salvation to take place, they have to begin to turn and they have to have a series of repentances when they're confronted with the truth of God's word. When they see that their actions are wrong, they have to humble themselves and continue to come underneath the authority. Not for salvation, but because of salvation. Because of salvation. If there's true salvation there, the Spirit of God comes in and He wants to do these things in our lives. So that we will be a witness to the saving mighty power of God. That he truly has come. He truly does save. And he truly is coming back. But to go on and continue doing. What we've always done. I believe is false conversion. Notice Saul. Now some people will say wow. He immediately preached. The Christ. In the synagogues that he is the son of God. Now everybody's already arguing. Remember where we're at. Not many days separated from Christ being crucified, died, rose again. They're already arguing about this Jesus. There's already big dispute. So he's proving that he's the Son of God. The Messiah. This Christ is. He's immediately preaching it. Well, Saul already knows the Old Testament scriptures. And now his, life, his eyes have been opened. That's not something that you and I could actually do perfectly the way that Saul probably was refuting Jewish leaders there because he knew the scriptures so well. We weren't raised in a system where you're reading the Bible. However, there's many cultural Christians who might be reading their Bible and still not saved. What? Well, if, if they're not doing anything but reading their Bible and going to church and they're not literally surrendering their life and their heart to do the work of the ministry, they may not be saved. They may be caught up in a system reading their Bible going, this is good stuff. But at the same time, their hearts are still following the American dream. Their hearts are still following their childhood dreams. Their hearts are still following the traditional cultural system that does nothing to lift up Jesus except whatever their plans are. They leave the power of God out. There's a form of godliness, but we leave the power of God out. False conversion in the church. He immediately, it means it's straight away in the King James, uh, at once or shortly thereafter, he preached. Now what do you do? Why is he preaching? Because you, what, he's not preaching... Like he's teaching Ananias. He's not preaching like he's teaching believers. Who do you preach to? We preach, we herald good news as a public crier. It's to proclaim and publish good news, the gospel, divine truth, to unbelievers. He's speaking to the synagogues. That was his practice. He would always go into unbelievers first. Immediately, he is preaching to unbelievers. That's called witnessing. That's what we're called to do. I was blind, but now I see. However, our hearts still want to do everything else we're doing. Instead of saying, whoop, whoop, got to drop everything here. I got a new life. I got a new hope. I got a new authority. I got a new father. I got a new kingdom, a new inheritance. This is new life i got to stop doing what I was doing and begin doing this new life. 
How does Saul grow? He begins immediately to pray, to cry out to God, to, to seek and share, to seek and share with those in the synagogues. He showed up at the synagogue. He didn't show up going, hey, I got some letters here. I want to arrest some Christians. He showed up and told them the good news that on the road to Damascus, he just met Jesus Christ and he is the son of God. He was mistaken. His life changed. He's preaching in the synagogues that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The Messiah is the Son of God. And what happens when people hear and see change? Then all who heard were amazed. It means to be astounded or put out of your wits. Beside themselves. What? It's something that stands out when your life changes. Conversion should be seen. Because you're no longer in the places you were. And now you're in new places. Now you're talking about new things. They were Those who heard were amazed. They're out of their wits and said, Is this not he who destroyed those who called on the name in Jerusalem? And has come here for that purpose so that he might bring them bound to the chief priest. So they know what's going on. They knew he was coming. Remember, Ananias knew it. He shared it with God. They knew what he was there for. They knew what his life looked like. It's another one of those arguments to remain where you're at when you're saved. Let people see the conversion. They knew what you were doing. They knew how you were living. They knew where you were going, and you're no longer there, but you're at a new place. You're in fellowship. It should amaze people. It should be amazing grace. It should be something that people talk about because your life changes so drastically. But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. He was being the evidence. He was showing the evidence. He was probably taking them to Scripture. I'm not going to take you there. Come to our uh, Bible studies. Look at the Scripture that is always pointing to Jesus. It's everywhere when you let the Holy Spirit unveil it, uncover it, reveal it to you. It's everywhere in the Old Testament. But we have to have God's power to open it up and then receive it in our heart. And we can't convince anybody of it. It's only a work of the Holy Spirit. But he increased more in strength. Why? Because he's praying. Behold, he prays. Listen, you are not going to increase in strength. You are not going to grow in your Christian faith. You are not going to be able to share. You are not going to be converted unless you're in the Word, Prayer, and Fellowship. I believe this more today than I believed it 21 years ago. It's not going to happen. For 21 years, I've watched people that say they believe in Jesus. And their lives don't change. It takes a surrender with our hearts to the Word of God. Oh, it takes the grace of God. Don't, 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 don't ever leave out the grace of God. That's where salvation comes from. But then with the grace of God, our hard hearts have to surrender to the work of God, to the power of God, to the spirit of God. And he says he's going to change us in the word, prayer, and fellowship. And if we don't get into those stains, our conversion is not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. There's not going to be any conversion. You're going to have an old musky basement with a ping pong table down there, and you're going to be yelling, I'm saved. I'm, I'm playing in my rec room. What are you doing? I'm down in my converted rec room. And yet you'll have no hope. Yet you'll, you'll have no joy. Yet you'll share no Christ. But you'll declare that you're converted and that you've repented. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, he will also reap. And if we sow to the wind, we will reap the whirlwind. And God died so that we would not have to reap the whirlwind. 
God died and wrote us a love letter so that we would not have to think we could sow to the wind and reap good out of it. If we keep being rebellious and keep living in a way that chases everything except surrendering to the work and the will of God and the ways of God, looking for his glorious appearing, make no mistake, we're going to reap that. We've been set free to follow Christ. Saul increased in strength because he was praying. His eyes had been open. He had met the Lord Jesus and he wanted to know more. He confounded them. He threw them into disorder is what the word confounded means. They were perplexed. They couldn't understand it. You came here with letters to arrest and you're standing up here preaching that Jesus is the Son of God. Totally changed his mind, repentance, totally changed his direction, totally changed how he thought, what he talked about. Now, I want to tell you, and I, I don't want to, I don't want to, in any way bring about any type of confusion here. But we're going to stop right there and jump over to the book of Galatians. And then we'll come back. But there's a, there's a, a gap of time somewhere here. And, and, and when Paul later is giving his testimony, which he does all the time. Notice he instantly done it there in the synagogues. That's what, it, that's what it's going to say. Uh, go to Galatians 1. We're going to begin in verse 11. We find that more stuff was going on. I want to give it to you in like a little capsule. We don't have to know the perfection of it. But we do know, and I don't even know where it fits in here perfectly. I'm trying to be led by the Spirit. But Saul, on the way to Damascus, meets Jesus. He, he gets saved. He gets baptized. He begins to be obedient. He's confounding people with his testimony. And he spends three years in this region, Damascus, Syria, the Red Sea, the Persian Gulf, uh, 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 in the area that he's in right now, Arabia. He spends three years here. And I think it's very interesting. I, I, just think about this interesting. How long did the disciples spend with Jesus? Three years. Plus, right around three years, they were with Jesus. And then Saul spent some three years with Jesus in this area. Now, I believe he was praying. I believe he was talking. I believe he was having revelation from God who was showing him truth of what the scriptures meant. I, I don't necessarily believe that he sat down with Jesus, although he might have. If you're a Bible student, you know that in 2 Corinthians 12, he said, I know a man once and went into the third heaven. And he talks about that. And many people believe that that's when he was stoned to death at Thessalonica. But it doesn't necessarily mean that that's when it was. We don't know what really went on with Saul. I'm not trying to read into the text or add to the text. I'm telling you that revelation from God is available for you and me. And if you follow men, you might end in a ditch. But there's a personal love relationship to be had in conversion. And man doesn't teach you, the Spirit of God does. And in order for you to know that you are following God, you have the Word of God. It's right here, written down, the unchanging God is giving you the word of God. So when you're talking to him, because there's a lot of other spirits out there that would like to talk with you. And you want the Holy Spirit to teach you. And how do you know if the Holy Spirit's teaching you? Does it line up with the immutable character of God? Does it line up with his word of what he's been doing, what he's doing, what he wants you to do, what he's always done throughout history, what he's doing with his creation to bring them to salvation in conversion. That's what you want to know. Because familiar spirits are out there speaking to people. And they're bringing all kinds of mysticism and deception into the church. 
all kinds of experience and feelings and emotions and things that are outside the Bible. And then they want to act like they're giving you some new revelation. I'm here to tell you, if it's new, it's not from God. He's the Ancient of Days. If it's new, it's not from God. And if it's from God, it's not new. He's doing the same thing he's always done. Bringing us into an inheritance, into his house, to have a love relationship with us. So over in Galatians 1, and I, I don't want to go to a bunch of places to, 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 to mess with you, but see, we're supposed to study the scriptures. And the scriptures, as Saul continues to write letters to churches and tell his testimony, he gives us more information. And he's writing to the church in this region of Galatia where they're being bewitched. They've been listening to familiar spirits. They've departed from the true gospel that he gave to them. And he's saying, listen, I didn't give you this gospel because some man taught it to me. I gave you this gospel because I spent time in the word, prayer, and fellowship. I spent time with Jesus, and Jesus revealed to me what I was supposed to teach you. That's why the scriptures want you to see here clearly that he did not immediately go to Jerusalem. Where the other people were who knew the truth, who had spent three years with Jesus. They want you to see that this is all available today. If you will come into the throne room. And it's always going to line up with the same gospel. In fact, later when you really read this and we get to it. And they find out the boys goes, wow, he's teaching the same gospel we teach. And we didn't give it to him. So it must be true. He must have got it from Jesus. Because he's teaching what we teach. And he used to try to kill us for teaching that. Listen to me. This is not about man handing down tradition and teaching to you. This is about you having a conversion and meeting Jesus and sitting down and surrendering to his authority and spending time in his word and coming to him and letting him change you and letting him take you out to tell other people what he's showing you in the scriptures. And it's going to line up with the word of God. And if it doesn't, you need to throw it out. It's from a familiar spirit. It's from, it's from the deception of the devil. Trying to get you to listen to the old master and to your flesh, which is supposed to be dead, in the grave, buried. But we have this all over the church. People that are really good orators. And, and, and you know why they fill up the church? Because we love to let our flesh get stroked. We love to hear something that lines up with what we already want to do. My flesh already wants to go out and live prosperously. My flesh already wants to resist the living God. I don't need anybody to teach me that. So what does it do? It comes and it looks like light. It looks like it's good. It gets really close to the truth of God. And it teaches you you can have it all. It teaches you mystical stuff. And one of the big things they're doing now is the, 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 the yoga which is evil. It's from the pit of hell. If you're a Christian, stop practicing evil mysticism in any form. Oh, well, I'm just doing exercises. Well, then do them without yoga. Then we have exercises. Can't you jog without yoga? Listen to me. I'm serious. That's mysticism. It's mysticism. It's evil. It's from familiar spirits. It's a demon. Trying to get you to empty your mind so a familiar spirit can teach you something. The Bible does teach you and I to meditate. The Bible does teach us to pray. But you don't empty yourself. You die to self. You die to self so that Christ can live in you and through you and for you and show you truth. And if we read the word of God, we find this out. If we study the word of God, we find these truths out. If we come boldly to the throne of grace and say, hey, Lord, Lord, here I am just being honest. I'm, it's real easy for me to get lost. It's real easy for me to believe a lie. It's real easy for me. Could you please show me the truth? And he'll say, read my word. Here it is. Here's truth. Jesus is truth. The way, the truth, and the life. John 14, 6. It's our compass. It keeps us in the right place. 
it's very important that we see the conversion testimony of Saul because Saul is showing us through the scripture, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that he didn't get this handed to him by Peter and James and John. It was a personal relationship with Jesus. In fact, they really butt heads. And he's got, let's just read it. He's, he tells us in chapter 2 of this, they didn't add anything to me. How can man add anything to someone who has surrendered to Jesus? He says, I've seen them guys and talked with them. They didn't add nothing to me. I had already, he honored them. He honored them. He respected them. He knew them as the disciples. He gave them preference. He didn't even, he didn't even try to be rude with them. But how could they add? How can I add anything to you? If you've been meeting with Jesus, you're meeting with the God of the universe. He is teaching you divine truth. And the only thing we can do is, is kind of hang out together and learn together and correct one another. How can I add anything to you if you're at the throne room with God? What I can do is build you up. I can exhort you. I can consider you. I can stir you up to build your love relationship. That's what the scripture tells us to do. I can stir you up by what God's doing in my life because you grow as much as you go. You grow as much as you get in that throne room. You grow as much as you get in that word. And we stir one another up. Yet I fear that we've been bewitched. As Paul says to the church in Galatia, we've listened to familiar spirits. We've, we've listened to the devil of old. The same way Eve did. And we've come back underneath his authority. And we put ourselves back in bondage again. In the church today. In Texas. Not here. <clears throat> he says in Galatians 1.10. For do I persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still please men. I would not be a bondservant of Christ. See I'm not looking to please men is the, the position of conversion. Love them? Yes. Serve them? Yes. Stir them up? Yes. But men pleasers cannot be God pleasers. But God pleasers can please men if men are looking to be God pleasers. If we're looking for God, we can stir one another up. If we're looking to be build our own kingdom or please men, it's not going to be good. He's talking about being a doulos, a voluntary servant of God, one who surrendered to God completely. And that's what every Christian is called to be. Not just Saul, not just Peter, not just James. Every one of them became douloses. They became voluntary servants of God to do God's will. And they were all killed for doing it because the world hates us. The world's underneath the sway of the wicked one. The world hated Jesus first. And he says in verse 11, But I make known to you, brethren, people who's in the church that know Jesus, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither, neither received it from man, nor was I taught it. Listen. Nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. The uncovering. It was revealed. It was disclosed by Jesus Christ. Christ. Listen, most false doctrine, most false teaching is learned from men. You're not going to get it meeting with Jesus. He doesn't teach any falsehood. There's no lie in him. But you can be indoctrinated with a traditional lie. You can be indoctrinated with man's rules and religion. And you can pass it on to somebody else. I don't know how it was revealed. I'm going to just tell you that clearly. I said it earlier. I don't know if they sit down together or if he's just talking about the way that I do it, the way you should be doing it, coming boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need, coming to seek truth, sitting down with God, and he reveals it. He takes the cover off. He shines light in the darkness, and you see your sin. He shines light on the darkness, and you see the truth. He opens the scriptures up, because it's a spiritual book, by the power of his Holy Spirit. And he does it with each of us. In fact, if I ever say anything up here that lines up with the gospel, it's, and you receive it, it's all a work of the Holy Spirit. It's all because God revealed it to you. 
It's, I'm just acting in my gift. God is the one that shines lights on it. We don't need anybody to teach us. The Spirit teaches us. The Spirit conforms us. The Spirit converts us. The Spirit baptizes us in the body of Christ. It's the Spirit of God who is doing this. And if you don't surrender to that work and the authority of God's kingdom, then it's the Spirit of God who is not doing the work in your life. But it's you doing it and the world doing it. And there's no work going on of construction and conversion, you might have that basement that's musky with just a ping pong table down there that is still breathing death. I think it's very important that we understand what conversion is. And we see that this gospel that he's preaching didn't come from man. It wasn't taught, but it was revelation, uncovering, let me find it. From the word to take the cover off. Isn't that interesting? Does that, does that surprise anybody? Think about this for a minute, because I always bring this up, and I love to bring this up. Old Testament, the law, was a covering. It's a covering that led us to know that we needed Christ. In Christ, the light is shined in the darkness, and the cover is taking off. We don't need the law anymore. We don't need sacrificial systems anymore. It was a kofar that covered our sin until the true freedom comes that's in Christ. The Lamb of God, the blood of God that takes away the sins of the world. So the word revelation itself, just like the book, means to take the cover off. It means to, 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 to disclose, to let it appear. And is disclosed by the Holy Spirit. Are you listening for his voice? Are you looking to have the cover taking off of your heart? Are you looking for Christ to shine light in your darkness? To change you and teach you? That's what, that's what we're doing here is being equipped. Somebody asked me yesterday, well, well, have you been going to door to door, knocking on houses and meeting people and introducing yourself? I said, no. Not because I'm lazy, because it produces false converts. Would it be effective in some ways? Maybe. Listen, all the work of salvation, all the work of conversion in the kingdom of God is done by the Spirit of God. If I go do things just because people are doing it traditionally and, and think I'm going to go do the work of the ministry to get somebody's heart to change, I'm confused. I'm deceived. Only God and you personally coming to God and having the light turned on in your heart to see that you are now owned by God because of the blood of God is going to get any conversion done in your life. It's the only way conversion is done in my life. But if it is done, we get up and immediately tell others about it. It astounds them because we're doing life differently when we meet Jesus Christ. I mean, think about it. If we've been walking around in the dark, bumping into everything, stepping on everybody, knocking stuff over, we can't see. You ever try to walk through a dark room? All the damage that gets caused if you just try to walk through a dark room and you don't know what's going on. That's what it is, being born in darkness. And then the light comes on, and you go, oh, I can maneuver that. Oh, I don't have to step on them. Oh, I can get over here. Oh, I can go down through here. It's a straight path. He's making it straight. You can see with the light on. You can see with it being revealed and uncovered. Think about it. Going in, you remember them old shows? Uh, well, maybe they're new shows, too. But you go into an old house, and all the furniture's covered up, and there's dust everywhere. And then you uncover, and all these treasures are there. Wow, look at this. Hutch, wow, look at this. It's got an old dust. You uncover it and reveal it. That's what God wants to do, but he wants us to come and be hungry for it. He wants us to come and surrender our hard hearts and enjoy the treasures of his salvation and learn to walk in a way that is pleasing to him. And anyway, Galatians 1, 13, he goes on. For you have heard 
Everybody heard about Saul of Tarsus for some reason. You have heard of my former conduct. Notice that. This is his testimony. Former conduct. Notice it's former. It's not the same conduct. He's not still bumping into stuff in the dark because it's the former conduct because he come to salvation. He's being converted. They heard of his former conduct. He's not doing the same thing. These words are very important. Because true conversion produces change. It's not the same conduct anymore. His former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God, the called out ones of God, the ecclesia, beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism. Here you're hearing his, his former conduct. You're hearing what he used to do. Beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my father. See that word again? Traditions. What was he, what was he zealous for? It doesn't say he was zealous for God. Says he was zealous for religious activity, the traditions of his fathers. What was handed to you know that there's entire church movements that they don't believe the word of God, but they believe the father's traditions? Entire movements that they practice what the fathers did and the traditions, and they put the word of God second. And they think that that's a good thing to do because they don't believe Paul's testimony. When you follow tradition, the word is transmission. What drives you? What's driving your life today, saint? Is it the Holy Spirit because of the Word of God and fellowship? Because you're meeting in prayer in the throne room? Is that your transmission? What's moving your power? What's moving your zeal? It means transmission. Jewish traditionary law. Here's the interesting thing. It's from a word that means to be put in prison. That word transmission, tradition. It's from a word that means to be put back in bondage. When you follow the traditional teaching of somebody, instead of being led by the Spirit of God, what's the difference? Listen to me. It's very, it's very urgent in the church for conversion. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. These are the children of... No, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's rewrite it. As many as are led by the traditions of the church, these are the... Think about it for a long moment because it's simple truth. Very simple truth. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the children of God. Is the Spirit of God working in your life to convert you into the image of God for the glory of God? Because Saul's testimony is, is that there wasn't nobody as zealous as he was for the traditions of the fathers. But we already know that they were so traditional and they were so much into what they were doing that they missed the Messiah. And he warns us when he's writing the church in Colossae to beware lest anyone would spoil you, cheat you, deceive you through philosophy or empty deceit according to the uh, traditions of man or the basic principles of this world and not according to Christ. For you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. He warns over and over that we need to be careful what transmission is moving us. The tradition. I, I know there, there might be some good traditions in the church, but I, I really am saddened by some of the argument and division and things that go on when you show somebody a clear scripture and they keep following tradition. That means they don't believe the Word of God. That means they just don't believe the Word of God. And that's where most of the problem comes in. Do we believe the Word of God? Do we know the Word of God? Are we in the Word of God? There's churches that believe everybody's supposed to speak in tongues and they're supposed to go up and do it all the time or you're not even saved. 
What's their transmission? What's driving that? Where's that come from? It's not scriptural. Paul gives perfect instructions, two or three at the most, and then only if there's an interpreter. Or you should be silent in church and speak between you and God at home. He gives clear, whole paragraph. And yet, when you confront people who believe that way, they choose tradition over truth. I mean, what are we going to choose? Truth or tradition? I'm not talking about rewriting church. I'm talking about listening to the Bible. See, because people come in and go, oh, I try to change everything. You don't want to do what we do. No, we're not. If we're apostate and we've walked away from God, we don't have any faith. Is he even going to find faith when he comes? And, 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 and our system is, is failing because we're ignoring the word of God and the truth of God. And we keep following everything else. How are we walking away from God if we actually practice what the Bible says? It's, it's ridiculous. It's redundant. And yet, if you say anything about their traditional teachings, well, this is how we traditionally teach it. And you can't be part of us if you don't teach it the same way. Then they're saying, we want to put you in prison with us, and you get the bunk right next to me instead of following truth. What say you? That's why it's so important that you have a personal love relationship. What if I'm up here teaching new age mysticism and trying to convince you to contemplate your belly button. Get more lint, by the way, out of a dryer than you do out of your belly button. Just, just, just a little wisdom if you're looking for lint. Because that's all you're going to find is lint at your belly button. But again, that's, that's uh, the, the insanity of today's church. They'll do anything except read the Word of God and follow the Spirit of God. We'll do anything to feel good in our emotions about our religious actions. I mean, we think giving money makes us religious. We, th we think giving our time makes us religious. We think that th th these things are absurd. You can't do nothing but believe in Jesus. And it, but if you believe in Jesus, it's going to transform your life. There's going to be real conversion. There's going to be the Spirit of God that comes in and changes your life for God. You're going to see clearly that that darkness is dead and flee it. Why would you stay in the car and drive off the cliff when the light has shown you that it's going off the cliff? I think I'll just hang out here. Open the door and get out. Walk by the Spirit. Oh, I was thinking of a story my brother told me. He said he had to be cut out of a car once with the jaws of life. And here's his, here's his, here's his thinking before he was saved. He said, I knew they was drinking, but I didn't know they were doing quaaludes. I'd have never gotten in the car if I'd known they were doing quaaludes. <laughs> That's how you think when you're blind. It's okay to get in that they're drunk as skunks, but boy, if I know they're doing quaaludes, I'd have never got in the car. <laughs> he almost died. I laughed. I almost wrecked the vehicle when he's telling me it. It's so funny. It's so, it's so crazy now to look back on it. And that's what light does. Light shows you the insanity of how you used to think. I don't know how I ever thought I could actually get through this, but listen to me. If you get nothing else out of this, you have to have a relationship with Jesus. You need to have it through the Spirit of God who takes the Word of God and reveals it with light into your heart, which shines into darkness, and you build this relationship. Yes, your relationship is with me and the rest of the body of Christ, but if you don't have a relationship with God, you have no way of having a relationship with us that's going to be real. And if you have a relationship with me and learn some truth and you don't have one with God, you still go to hell. It has to be a relationship with God. That is eternal life. Go look it up. Write it down, John 17, 3. Just write it down and look it up later and say, God, what does that mean to me? John 17, 3. 
So Paul, he was zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, see that contrast? Wait a minute, see that word but? That was Damascus Road conversion, light in my face. I've seen Jesus. I'm going one way, and now I'm going to go the other. That whole but, that's what that was. You could teach for months on just that word, but. Look at it. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb, he's the creator. He's the one that gave me life. He separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace. Notice where it came. Through grace, through his graciousness, his divine influence upon the heart, and the reflection in the life. Listen, you can't say you've received grace if it has no reflection on your life. If there's no true conversion, you haven't received the grace of God. There's a divine reflection. It, it, it shines in your darkness, then it changes you. Look it up. That's what the word means. He called him. He called him forth from where? From death. He called him forth to where? To him. To God. To his throne room. To meet how? When? As often as you want. It pleased God. He separated him from his mother's womb. He created him and called him to his grace to do what? What did he do? Why did he call us? To reveal, to uncover his son in me. Isn't that what he's putting in us? He's conforming us into the image of his son. Why? Why would he make us like Christ? Because his children obey his authority. Why would he make us like Christ? Because he loves us and he wants fellowship with us. Why would he uncover that in us and disclose it in us? Oh, that I might preach him among the Gentiles. Now listen, I will say that that's probably specifically Paul. Because he told him, I was showing him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. He showed him that he will preach to the Gentiles and to kings and to the nation of Jerusalem, nation of Israel. Not everybody's called to be a preacher, but every one of us are called to be a witness. To allow that grace that shines in our heart to have an influence. That it would witness to somebody else. That they would be, that they would be astounded that we no longer do what we used to do. Listen to me. Paul was called to preach. Paul was called to preach specifically to the Gentiles. But all of us have been called through his grace to reveal the image of his son in our lives, to become more like Christ, that we might do whatever it was that he purposed to do. What did he make you for? What did he separate you from your mother's womb for? Why has he called you? That's for you in your personal relationship to join with God and say, here I am, send me. What is it you want me to do? But you should do it. Notice what he says. I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood. He didn't talk with them. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem. You know what? If you think about it, Saul of Tarsus left Jerusalem with letters from the chief priest. He was going to go arrest him. If he comes back and he's got nobody, he's got to give an answer. Right? So he's probably like, I ain't going back. They want to kill him. So he didn't go back. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles. Notice this. Look, look, here's a big word before me. He's an apostle. He's one sent forth. And he's also an apostle according to biblical standards that you had to see Jesus because he's seen him on the road to Damascus. Those that were apostles before me. In other words, the other 11. What did you do, Paul? But I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Now, Arabia is the region there. If you look it up, it's going to mean, Arabia means uh, the region of Asia, including Syria, which Damascus is the capital. Uh, it, it, it's it's uh, Egypt, the Gulf of Arabia, the Persian Gulf, the Red Sea. It's that area there. That's where he went. How long was he there? Then after three years, he's there three years. He's given us all the details here. Now, I believe he was all around that area, even maybe in Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter. Your Bible might say Cephas, same guy. And remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now concerning the things which I write to you, indeed before God, I do not lie. 
What happened after you did those 15 days in Jerusalem? Afterward, I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, back to Damascus, and I was unknown by face to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ, but they were hearing only, he who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy, and they glorified God in me. He's given his testimony. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, and what? We do not love our life to the death. Quit holding on to self-life. Quit holding on to yourself. Let it go. Surrender to Jesus and say, Lord, send me. Why did you call me? Why did you separate me from my mother's womb? What is my purpose in the body of Christ other than word, prayer, and fellowship and edify the rest of the body? It's your personal relationship. You get what you put into it. And God's ready to give all. He died on a cross for you. They didn't know him. He wasn't using any influence. He was just preaching what Christ had did in his life. And then it says in 2.1 of Galatians, Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and also took Titus with me. And how did you go up? Oh, I went up by revelation. God told me to. It was disclosed to me. And communicated to them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to those who were of reputation, lest by any means I might run and have run in vain. Oh, you could run in vain? You could be empty and you're running? Yet not even Titus, who was with me, uh, never mind. Let's just go back to um, Acts chapter 9, and we'll close up the text. And a few short comments. Listen, we want to see the fullness of what happened and what Saul was doing. He was meeting with Jesus. He was talking with Jesus. I believe that's still available. That the Holy Spirit is who reveals truth. He guides us and leads us into all truth. Truth is Jesus. He sent the Spirit back for that purpose. If you'll ask and surrender and you'll be in the word, prayer, and fellowship, He wants to do the same thing in you. He knows what's going on in your life. He knows the heart of God, Romans tells us. He knows what He can do and what He's called you for and how to train you. No matter whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. Now, we're going to get into it a little bit later. I wanted to get into to Saul's testimony. We might. I don't know. You guys are like, we ain't going 15 hours, are we, dude? It's Mother's Day. So if you go back to Acts chapter 9, you know, Saul is increasing in strength. He's confounding the Jews and dwelt in Damascus. He's proving that Jesus is the Christ. Uh, go read uh, uh, Isaiah 53. Now after many days were passed, oh, maybe three years, the Jews plotted to kill him. The same ones he came, you know, here's the Jews that he came, he was part of when he was on his way to Damascus, but their plot became known to Saul. I wonder who revealed that. God is the one who uncovers things, shines light in the darkness, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. There you go. He's, he's there to arrest and kill Christians, and now his life is being threatened. Why? Because the devil doesn't want anybody to tell people about Jesus Christ. And what happens as a result when you do, Greg? Then he wants to kill you. And so now come and join the Christian faith so you can die. That's the true gospel message, isn't it? But to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. And God will always protect you. You're indestructible until he's finished with you. You don't have to worry about dying. If you fear man who can kill you, and you don't fear God who can kill the body and the soul and cast it into hell, mm -mm. fear of man produces a stumbling block, but the fear of God produces righteousness. So, uh, verse 25, Then the disciples took him by night and led him down through the wall, or led him down through the wall in a large basket. Kind of reminds you of Jericho when the spies got away and, and Rahab let them down through a window. So he escapes. Well, who saves him? The very same people he came to kill three years prior 
or actually who he's been fellowshipping with, and they love him so much that they're protecting him, and they lower him down in a basket. The people that used to be the enemy are your greatest allies when you're in the body of Christ. Now, some would say, well, he should have just stayed there and let him kill him. Listen, it's okay to use some intellect up in this kingdom. It's okay to let God speak to you and come up with a plan and get out of being dead. Listen to it. It's serious. Because most people, oh, well, I guess if I'm going to die, i got to die. It's okay to run. Live to fight another day. Think about if Saul would have said, well, the Lord's will be done. I'll just stand here till they kill me. We wouldn't have got the gospel that he wrote to us. Of course, he did it to the Spirit, so God could have done it. But I'm just saying, don't just put yourself in harm's way. Don't tempt the Lord. You can make plans, but make sure that you plan them through God with his will, his wisdom, his ways. So some people put the gap of time right there. Um, I think in that entire three years, this is what happened. This is the culmination of those three years. I can be wrong. I'm not trying to be right. I'm just telling you how I'm dissecting the text. That it took a little while and he wouldn't shut up. And now they're ready as he returned back there uh, in that time. Uh, they're ready to kill him. In fact, look over at uh, 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians 11. And he'll tell you exactly who it was. See, he reveals these things. And as you study it, you find these things. It's, uh, I'm not going to give you his whole testimony. You read that later. It's 11, 22 through 33. But in 11, 32 and 33, he says, In Damascus, the governor under Ar Aratus, the king, was guarding the city of Damascus with a garrison. It wasn't just a couple soldiers, a whole garrison desiring to arrest me. But I was let down in a basket through a window in a wall and escaped from his hands. So he tells you some more content there. Let's go, 26. And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples. This is when he's talking about going up. But they were afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas, remember Barnabas, son of encouragement, took him and brought him to the apostles. Many believe that Barnabas was also studying under Gamaliel, so Paul and Barnabas knew each other from before. And Barnabas had gotten saved before. But you'll notice when they get down to Antioch, as we get to this, that Barnabas is the senior pastor, what we would call today. And then Paul comes over there and becomes the uh, uh, um, assistant pastor. And then when the Holy Spirit calls him, we're going to see that lesson. The Holy Spirit didn't call the newbies. He come and called the pastors. The pastors went out to plant new churches, not the flock. It was Paul and Barnabas that go on missionary trips. It was Paul and Barnabas that planted churches. It was Paul and Barnabas that had grown enough where they could leave and the church could handle itself. Today we do that upside down in our system. We let the pastors stay there and be comfortable instead of sending them out and using their faith that they're supposed to be growing in. Not being mean, not speaking against God's church, speaking against culture and entity and how we do things when we walk away from the wisdom of God. Barnabas brought him to the apostles, and he declared to them how he had seen. Listen to this here. He's given his testimony. He declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road, and how he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. See that word boldly? He keeps talking that, doesn't he? In Ephesians 6, he actually says, Oh, yeah, and if you're praying, pray for me that I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. That's all he ever asks for is to be able to speak boldly against the lies of the devil. He doesn't care if he dies. He says, I'll be with the Lord. He doesn't care if they beat him. He says, I, it, it's game to me. He wants to speak boldly the word of God, boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So he was with them at Jerusalem, coming in and going out. And look what he does. And he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians. It's in the King James, the Hellenists, Greek-speaking Jews, um, but they attempted to kill him. Remember, that's what they did. They lied, and they had Stephen killed, and they laid a coach down at Saul's feet. What do you think Saul's doing? You think he's trying to correct what he stood there and attested to before with Stephen? 
You think he's trying to say, wait a minute, whoa, 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 I know I, the coach were laid at my feet when you guys testified against Stephen and we stoned Stephen and killed him. But listen, Stephen was right. Stephen was preaching to Christ more fully and you need to listen. So they tried to kill him. And then the brethren found out about it and they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus, which is his hometown. Listen, he was in Tarsus for 14 years preaching. I meant to read that when we was over there in Galatia. 14 more years he was in Tarsus. That's 17 total years. Because a lot of times we think that, that Saul, I mean, 17 years total before we'll see him go up to the Jerusalem council, I believe. That's a lot of time. It takes time to grow. It takes time. But he's a preaching the entire time. He's speaking of Jesus the entire time. Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. What were they doing, Greg, is they were edified. They were walking. That's not peripateo. That's, that's just how you live. It's another word for live. Continuing the journey is what that means according to Thera's Greek-English lexicon. They were continuing to do what they were always doing. They were walking in the fear of the Lord. Not the fear of man. The fear of the Lord, which produces righteousness. And what happened then, Greg? And in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. Listen, when we're seeking to please God, we're going to receive the comfort of the Holy Spirit because that's who we're being led by. The Holy Spirit is the comforter. He's the counselor. He's the guide. He's the teacher. He's the one that's transforming us. He's the one that is placing Christ in us. He's the one that, that, that is doing the work. Are you letting him? How are you walking today? Is it in true conversion? Very important that we don't get caught in a system, that we don't get deceived into complacency, that we don't believe that just because we said a prayer at one time, we're okay. We're warned by, I believe Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, that we're to beware that there's not a hard heart in us in departing from the living God. Really? That's what it says. That's all I can do is tell you what the scripture says. I'm not going to tell you what, what tradition says. Paul said, be careful that there's not a hard heart in you, which is a heart that says no to his authority, instead of surrendering to his authority and to his word and his ways for his glory. A hard heart is what he saved us from. A hard heart was the heart we had. A heart that wouldn't receive his authority, wouldn't receive what he was saying. See, conversion takes that hard heart. Let me bring you back where we started. Conversion takes that hard heart that unrepentant, hard, stubborn heart and subdues it with the love of God so that we surrender and begin to change into the image of God for the glory of God as we come underneath his authority and say, yes, God. Because the fool has said no in his heart to God. And when we begin to say no to God, that's that hard heart, and that's how all the children in the wilderness fell dead. After they were delivered from Egypt and taken through the Red Sea and provided all the sustenance of bread and water from a rock. And then they got to the Jordan. They said, no, nope, to God, not going in, not going in. We're going to believe the familiar spirits and the liars. We're going to believe the demons. We're going to believe these other voices instead of listening to your authority, God. And we're not going across the Jordan. And every one of them fell dead in the wilderness except for Joshua and Caleb. Forty years going around in circle on the same rock, same hill, same truth, knowing that they could have just obeyed God and entered into his rest. True conversion. Praise. True conversion reads the word of God, the love letter of God. True conversion 
gets into fellowship with other disciples so that iron can sharpen iron and God can chip away and we can become the body of Christ with Christ as the head so that other people will see our love for one another. Listen, I'm here to tell you, the church right now as it is today in the world, there's not supposed to be unbelievers in the room. There, there's just not. The testimony is, is when you come to Christ, then the devil wants to kill you. Why would an unbeliever walk in there? Why would an unbeliever want to be someplace that's telling you to die to self and do the work of God? But why would somebody believe they're converted when they're not dying to self? and doing the work of God unless it's self-deception <laughs> examine yourself to see if you're in the faith I, I, I'm examining myself daily Paul said he died daily so that his heart didn't get up and become hard conversion repentance Change of mind, change of direction, to turn away from, but not just away from, but to the living God. Father, we give you praise and glory, and we thank you that we can walk in the reverential fear of who you are and what you've done and what you're doing. And that in walking in the fear of the Lord, we can be comforted by your Holy Spirit who gives us rest and peace and reveals your will to us and gives us gifts and uses us for your glory, for the equipping of the saints. Pour out your spirit upon us. Comfort us. Thank you for the blessed hope that you're coming back to take us home. Lord, pour out your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The Lord bless you. Beautiful.